My sermon today is on the greatest of these. Nothing big has come up yet. So in the, in the military, we do so much education. Um, and, and now it's, it's always online because you know you can't gather. So before you do your online class, I didn't have it all the way plugged in. Um, before you do your online class, sometimes you get lucky and there's thank you. There's a pretest. See if it pops up. There's a pretest. Um, we'll go over a pretest, but I don't really want you guys to give an answer. But um, do I need to do something, Jim? Okay, bring it back up again, see if it works. There we go. Oh, and we're at the pretest. So, which of these is the greatest? Patience, kindness, prophecy, gracefulness, control of temper? Don't give me the answer yet. So there'll be a post-test, and I'm sure everybody's going to get an A. Um, we're going to go over 1 Corinthians 13 today. I wanted to back up just a second and talk about 1 Corinthians 12. So let me read just the end of 1 Corinthians 12 so you know what's going on. So in 1 Corinthians 12, it's going through how is the, are the ears greater than the eye? Is the eye greater than the feet? And now it says, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And Christ and God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that, miracles. Then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. That's the end of 12. Now 1 Corinthians 13 Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have not love, I am become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits, profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not parade itself is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but wherever there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But that which is perfect has come. Then that which is part will be done away. When as a child I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know, just as I also am known. And now abide faith hope, love, these three, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And so if this is the class, then you'd stomp your feet and you'd point to the, but it's not. 
Um, so we're just going to go through and, and kind of look at each, each of this, these verses in there. Um, Though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or clanging cymbal. Um, Paul's here is kind of taking some hits at some different ways that they worship. Um, there are some gods that they worship, Dionysus and Sybil. They worship with cymbals and trumpets. And, and what he's saying is, you know, imagine if I just got up here and I was banging cymbals at you for however long this sermon is. You'd be like, what? That made no sense. Because it would just be me banging cymbals. And so that's what he's saying. You know, if you're, if you're just making noise, no one profits from that. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. This was a little bit uh, funny when I, I read. I went to Sermon Writer and another one to, to give me the ideas. And it said, it, it took a hit at doctors. And I was like, you know, because if you have all knowledge, I was like, well, I don't think that I'm that way. But anyway, it, um, it says two types of preaching. Kind of like getting the donkey to, to move forward. You can use the carrot or you can use the stick. I mean, you can, you know, put a carrot in front of a donkey and they'll move forward. Or you can get behind the donkey and whip them with a stick. Same with people. You can woo them with love or you can dangle, dangle hearers over the fire. Um, so you can preach of God's love or you can say, if you don't love God, you know, there's an alternative. And then that's what he's saying here. Either way you're doing it, if you're not doing it with love, you're doing nothing. Only the knowledge, only the knowledge whose cold detachment has been kindled by the, the fire of love can really save men. So if you're trying to scare them, you're not scaring, you're not helping them unless you're scaring them with love or through love. Nobody cares how much you know until I know how much you care. Everybody's heard that quote before. And, and that's what it's saying. It, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't matter how smart you are, how much you know, unless you're doing it with compassion and love. And though I stow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. To give us a smug moral character is a crushing rebuke. It is not charity at all. It is pride, which is cruel, for it knows no love. If you die for pride and self deplay self then martyrdom is valueless. I can't I looked for an image of this just for a second. I didn't want to be political, but everybody kept talking about Trump when he was passing out. Uh, things with Hurricane Maria and, and how he wasn't doing it to be generous or for the good of them. It was for his own pride. And, and I just remember that his image and he was throwing things at them instead of handing them. So, I mean, how would you like a gift if it was thrown at you? That kind of takes away the, the personalness of it or the gratitude or the, you know, it'd be, it's disrespect then if I just... If I'm up here throwing presents at you, but if I were to hand it to you and say, here, I see that you need this, it means so much more. Patient. This is a short, love is patient. And it's, it's patience with people, not with, cir with um, circumstances. The, the analogy they gave was President Lincoln and General Edwin Stanton. I don't know if it's me touching this or... Um, and Edwin Stanton called Lincoln the original gorilla and other insults. And Lincoln's rebuke to him was nothing. He never, he never commented on it. Never. And he lived his whole life. The, and the day he died, according to the one I um, read, it was when he was looking over Abraham Lincoln, when he was shot, he says... There lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. And so he realized when Lincoln was dead, how bad he had been. And that's kind of, kind of tough. But I think he kept kind of pushing him, thinking, Lincoln at some point in time is going to push me back. And I'm like, see? See how he is? But Lincoln never did. He was very patient throughout his whole life. Kind. Love is kind. 
gentle, mild, tender, unpleasant. The opposite of acting bitter, sharp, disagreeable, and harsh. And then the image says it all. Kindness is a reflection of what is in our heart. And so, it's, later on we'll talk about a mirror, but it's mirror image. It's, it's what's in you. Love does not envy. There are two types of envy. Those that want what others have, and that's what I always think of. That's what envy is. But they said another one. It's those that hate that others have what they do not have. So it's not so much that you want what they have. It's just that you hate that they have what they have. And then in this image, I wish it would go circular because it's so true. You know, people with long hair want short hair. And people with short hair want long hair. And people with curly hair want straight hair. And people that are tall want to be short. And, you know, everybody wants what they don't have. But the funny thing is, the people that have what you don't want sometimes want what you have. And it's so, so funny how we are. And we're never happy with what we have, but we always think that it would be better if we had what they have. The grass is always greener on the other side. But the funny thing is, your neighbor may be looking at your horticulture and say, you know what, I wish I had a rock yard instead of all this green grass. But we don't know. We just get self-absorbed. We have kind of grass now. In El Paso we had in El Paso we had a rock yard and it was so funny because if it thought about sprinkling the grass just grew right through it so then you hated the grass because you're trying no it's supposed to be rocks. But Love is not a braggart. True love will always be far more impressed with its own unworthiness than its own merit. Some people confer their love with the idea that they are conferring a favor but the real lover cannot get over the wonder that he is loved. And then, we love because he first loved us, that he is God. And, and that's the thing, it's, again, it's circular. We love God because he loved us, and so it's, it's circular. Um, and you can't brag that you love God. He loved, be, loved you before you were even born, so there's no way you can top him. Love is not... Not inflated with its own importance. Really great men never think of their own importance. Then there's a story of William Carey. I didn't know anything of William Carey, but he translated the Bible into 34 different languages. And he was at a, a social function, and someone meant to, to disgrace him or dishonor him because his profession before then, they said, I suppose you once were a shoemaker. And he corrected them. He said, No, I wasn't a shoemaker only a cobbler. So he didn't even take their, their insult at that high of a level. It's like, no, I wasn't even that high. I wasn't even a shoemaker. I was just a cobbler. And so he was so humble as to say, no, I, I was not even that important. I just fixed shoes. I didn't even make them. But in actuality, he had translated the Bible into 34 different languages. I and mean, that's pretty impressive. It does not behave gracelessly. Um, Blunt and brutal is not winsomeness, which is the opposite. So, graciousness is Christian love. Never forgets that courtesy and tact and politeness are lovely things. Grace is a little prayer. Grace isn't a little prayer that you say before receiving a meal. It's a way of it's a way to live. It's funny just the things that stick in your head. If I keep my hands off of that, I think it's fine. Um, a million years ago, not really a million years ago, when I was enlisted, you have boards to get promoted and they, they make you memorize things. And they made you memorize the definition of tact. And that was a good 25 years ago. But tact is a keen sense of what to say or do to avoid, event, avoid offense. And I don't know why that stuck in my head, but that's from 25 years ago, the E5 board. Um, and so anytime I see tact, I remember that. And so it's, you got to think about it. There's a way to correct people nicely, and then there's also a way to correct them not, not gracefully. Um, and also, grace, I learned this a long time ago too. It, everything's an acronym in the military. It's God riches at Christ's expense. 
I didn't even touch it that time. Um, but, it, you know, grace is given to us, and so we should go ahead and give it to others. That would be the, the way we should work. Does not insist upon its rights. There are two types of people. Those that insist upon privileges and those who always remember their responsibilities. When I, in the military, um, you're an OIC, the officer in charge. I was an officer in charge of a, a clinic, and I told someone I went to dental school with, I'm going to be put in charge of a clinic. And they said, oh my, what power. And I corrected them right then. I was like, no, what responsibility. Because it didn't matter that I was in charge of them. It mattered that I was responsible for those people. And it was, it was so different, the perspectives of it. Those who are always thinking of what life owes them and those who never forget what they owe life. It's just a different perspective again. Love does not fly into a temper. Never exasperated with people. That's, that's tough. Exasperation is a sign of defeat. When we lose our tempers, we lose everything. Kipling said, Test of a man if he could keep his head when everyone else is losing his. The man who is master of his temper, temper can master anything. I don't know if you've ever seen someone just going off. It's... I don't even know how you would describe it. I've seen it several times where, in the military, full bird colonels are yelling at enlisted, you know, like E5s or below. And you just take a step back, you're like, why are you yelling at them? No matter what you say, they're going to say, yes, sir, and they're going to go do it. So you don't need to yell. If you were to ask nicely, they would do it, and they would do it joyfully. But now you're yelling, and now they're going to do it grudgingly. So it, does, it never made any sense. And I, I've seen it multiple times. And you just kind of look at them perplexed, like, why are you doing that? And, and we should take that into our life, you know? Because there's, just keep it inside your head. Be that duck, you know? Have those feet that are going a million miles an hour, but on the outside, going nice and smoothly. Does not store up memory of wrongs. One of the greatest arts in life is to learn what to forget. Um, it mentioned that there are certain tribes who, who are in you know, century-old battles with others. And the way they do to rekindle this, this battle is they'll take trophies and they'll hang them so that they remember. And it will, that will be their, the thing they focus on. And so they know that they hate that person. And if they forget that they hate that person, they can look at this trophy so they can remember that they hate that person. And I think that's, you know, it's terrible. I had a, a patient one time. The great thing about the Army, people who are tattoos, and I love looking at all their crazy tattoos. And I had a patient, it was years ago, he had a tattoo that says, my love, no, I'm sorry, totally opposite. My hate keeps me warm at night. That's what he had tattooed on his arm. And I was like, and I asked, I, I asked people, why do you have that? And he's like, because I hate a lot of people, and I want to remember that. I'm like, that's crazy. You know, you should be the opposite. But every day, he's looking at this tattoo right on his arm. My hate keeps me warm at night. No pleasure in evil doing. We prefer to hear of the misfortune of others rather than of their good fortune. And think about how many TV shows or... Um, you know, these, or, or even the internet, or the Inquirer, many forms of media, and that's all they focus on is the negative of people. So there's no pleasure in, in evil doing. Although it's easier to weep with them than to rejoice with those who rejoice. Isn't that terrible? Why can't we be happy, you know, with, with, with others or rejoice with them? But that's not a human nature. We, we focus on the negatives of, of it. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but the wicked turn from the way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from the evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Um, so if we're going to be like God, think about it. 
Think about how the Israelites treated God, and he didn't want them to die. So why should we relish in the negativity or the, the misfortune of others? Love rejoices with the truth. The more we love the truth, the better we can love those around us. That's it's pretty straight. Love can endure all things. Love can cover anything. Um, the, what it's saying here um, is never drag into the light of day the faults and mistakes of others. Quietly mend things, not publicly displaying or rebuking them. It went into, into this and it was written in Greek and it, meant, it was two different words, but it meant hunker down. So love hunkers down, meaning you're going to preserve and persevere through it. The couples that are meant to be are the ones that are to go through everything that is meant to tear them apart and come out even stronger than they were before. Love is completely trusting. And it's trusting in two things. It's trusting in yourself and trusting in others. It said, you know, go through the Bible and, and think of the whosoever's and change that whosoever into I. And so I, I typed into concordance, whosoever. And there was 136 verses with whosoever. But I pulled out the, the one that meant the most. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, I, believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so if you go through and, and focus on those whosoever's and think of them as yourself, it changes you know, the meaning of that text. But don't only trust in yourself, but trust in others. Um, it's saying that we make people who they are and who we believe them to be. And I, I told a story of a, a new headmaster in a school and, and he believed his students. And they, they said, his, his quote was, if you say it's true, I believe your word. And so no matter what they would say, you know, why are you late for class? And they would come up with this story and say, I believe you. No matter what the story was. And after a while I'd say, it's a, it's a shame to lie to him because no matter what we say, he believes us. And because he believed them, they changed. They started not lying and started doing the right thing because it, was, it made them feel bad when they lied because he believed in them. So it's a circular way. And, and we always have those people, no matter what they say, I don't trust them. What if we did the other? Maybe what if, no matter what they say, we trust them. So eventually, they're going to start becoming trustworthy. I think many people believe the best, the best way they can help others is to criticize them, to give them the benefit of their wisdom. I disagree. The best way to help people is to see the best in them. That's the, this quote. It's not my quote. Never cease to hope. Jesus believed that no one was hopeless. I think the prime example is the thief on the cross. I mean, he, he is there. He is going to die that day. And he was saved. And of course, there's an acronym for that. Hope. Have only positive expectations. We learn from the saved thief on the cross that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. And no matter the number of sins, and no matter if we or the world think our sins are minor or extreme, it is never too late to repent and accept the free gift of salvation. Love bears all with triumphant fortitude. George Matheson, um, this is a quote from him, he had lost his sight and he, he had um, lost in a relationship and he wrote, God's will, accept God's will, not with dumb resignation, which dumb resignation doesn't mean dumb resignation, it means mute resignation, not speaking, but with holy joy, not only with absence of murmur, but with a song of praise. And sometimes we, you know, we pray for God's will, but then when we get, you know, when we get what we get, we're like, ah, and we grumble about it. And he's saying, then not only accept it, but accept it joyfully, which is it's, it's tough. Um, love is permanent. Love never fails. Whatever prophecies there are, they will vanish away. Whatever tongues there are, they will cease. 
Whatever knowledge we have, it will pass away. The Song of Solomon, um, chapter 8, verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. So pretty much it's permanent. I mean, think, just think about any substance. It, and it's saying, no matter what you put on love, it's still going to be there in the end. Complete. This is a long verse. It is only part of the truth that we know now and only part of the truth that we foretell to others. But when that, when that which is complete shall come, that which is incomplete will vanish away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child. I used to think like a child. I used to reason like a child. When I became a man, I put an end to childish things. Now I see only reflections in a mirror, which leave us with nothing but riddles to solve. But then we'll see face to face with God. And again, Paul... At that time, he was in Corinthians. Well, he's talking to the Corinthians. And they were mirror makers. Although their mirrors weren't our mirrors. They polished metal. And so, you know how you've seen yourself in a, in a shiny piece of metal. And you think, well, I don't look like that. And that's what he's saying. You can see yourself in that, but you're not, it's not you. Supremacy. Now I know in part, then I will know even as I am known. Now faith, hope, and love remain these three, but the greatest is love. Greatest faith and hope are, love is still greater. Faith without love is cold, and hope without love is grim. Love is the fire which kindles faith, and is the light which turns hope into certainty. I love that image, though, because then at the end, love is the biggest, but... And then if we go through the post-test, which of these is the greatest? And so, it's just like any test that says all the above. A lot of times it is all the above. Um, and I, I didn't count, but I'd read there's 15 different um, synonyms for, for love when you list out patience, kind. Um, but the answer is love. Which of these is the greatest is love. I think I have time. Do have time? I have lots of time. So I'm going to read back through the verses one more time in the message verse. I, this, this sermon was probably from three different um, styles of, I think it was New King James, NIV, and then this is message. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but a creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to the mountains, jump, and it jumps, but don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I owe to the poor, and even to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't stretch doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always, first, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel with, uh, when others grovel, takes pleasures in the flower and truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, and keeps going to the end. Love never dies, inspired peach will be over, Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its, limit, reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth, and what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our, inc our incompleteness will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like an infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't yet see things clearly, we're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. See it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing Him directly, just as He knows us. But for right now, until the completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward the consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly. And the best of the three is love. That's the end of my sermon. Thank you.
And I'm sure there's a closing song.